when they were sharing the different diagnoses and, and the doctor had said something like, you may just not be able to throw around the baseball with your son in, in the front yard. If he has this genetic disorder, his bones could be very brittle and they could break and he may just not even be able to, to get around very well. I just remember surrendering to God. I trust you. I love you. I will continue to praise you, even though I am broken and a mess. Like I I trust you. Hello, friend. Welcome back to Mom's Grab Coffee, where we're helping you trust God through all the ups and downs of life. I'm your host, Hannah Lapsansky, and I'm so glad you're here. Today, I have another incredible mom friend with me. She's the founder of Praying Through Ministries, which was born from her personal journey in the NICU with her newborn son and through obedience to God. You'll hear how she found God in the depths of a deep, dark pit and how her obedience prepared her for one of the greatest battles in her life. That obedience ultimately led her to build a ministry that supports families walking through NICU and PICU seasons, as well as child loss. It's an amazing story, and you're going to find that God doesn't just walk us through our dark seasons, He goes ahead and prepares us for them as well. So, grab your coffee and get ready to be encouraged. This is Jessica's Story. Thank you again for making the time to join me here. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for asking me. I'm really humbled that you did. So very yeah, honored. For sure. Um, so <laughs> let's start with um, a little bit about yourself. Sure. Um, I'm a wife and mother of three. Uh, I'm a lover of people. I've walked through some really hard things in this life, but I've found that I am more resilient than I think. I'm optimistic, passionate, and now I'm faith-filled. I live in Florida, just minutes from the Gulf of Mexico, but I would much rather be in the mountains. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm pretty basic. You know, you can often find me dressed in jeans and Jesus tees and sockless. Sockless, yes, in Converse. (laughs) Mm -hmm. You have to in Florida, right? Yeah. Like I don't (laughs) want anything extra on my feet. It is hot. So even if my shoes might smell, I'm sockless (laughs) in them. (laughs) At least they're breathing kind of. They (laughs) are. All right. Well, let's jump into your journey because it's a very powerful story. I love how God just showed up and gave you such Mm -hmm. clarity and peace during a super scary circumstance with your son. Anything with children is just so nerve wracking. It pushes us to our limits. And I just love how God demonstrated that he's there. He's good. Mm -hmm. He's faithful. So let's jump in. Rewind us back to the moment before your life was rocked by this really scary NICU journey. Sure. So before the whole NICU came about, um, I was recently remarried. And in a God-centered marriage for the first time, totally content with life and having recently been saved, I think I was actually under this impression that, well, I already went through the hard thing in life and God's got me now. So the rest of it is going to be smooth sailing. So I really didn't anticipate anything difficult or bad ever happening again. And, um, when my husband and I were, you know, talking about having a child, we were really leaving it up to God because again, we were content with where we were and, and the blessings that we had in our two daughters, but we decided to leave it up to God and we got pregnant right away. And, um, it, I don't know, I, I want to say like in the second trimester is when I started kind of feeling like the spiritual warfare almost. And that really took me aback because like I said, I really thought God saved me from like the pit of death and despair. And I did not anticipate if I was walking with him, anything bad happening to me at all. Mm -hmm. And what was the spiritual warfare about? Yeah. I remember like 
being in the shower for one. And I feel like that is my quiet space. And as weird as it sounds, I can, I can hear God really clearly, like in the shower when like the water is running and maybe there are no distractions. But I remember these feelings coming to mind, like that something was wrong with my child. Um, I remember feeling like maybe it's something genetic or, um, the ideas came to mind of like miscarriage or stillbirth of a hospital stay. And then I remember those things also like flooding my, my Facebook feed too, at the same time. So I just remember this fear and worry, which I had never experienced in my other two pregnancies really coming to the surface in a scary way. And I knew because it was fear that it wasn't from God at all. Mm -hmm. So I felt like that was, that was an attack on me. And so what I tried to do in those moments was to prophesize God's promise over my baby. So for example, when I was thinking that, you know, something is wrong with him, like there's some kind of genetic defect, I would say in my mind or out loud, this baby is fearfully and wonderfully made. And this baby is mm-hmm. created with a purpose and on purpose. And then uh, I just remember saying like, no weapon of the enemy is is going to prosper. And I just had to keep kind of like preaching God's word to myself over and over again, just like in the Bible where, um, you know, Jesus is in the wilderness and the devil comes up to him and tries to tempt him. And he comes back at him with scripture. I felt like it was the same thing for me. Like I felt like the enemy was coming at me and I needed to fight him with scripture. How do you think that warfare was triggered? I don't know if, if I think about it, like, okay, I was saved. I'm walking with the Lord. But then I also think that given my um, husband's background and the trauma that he went through, as a child, I felt like this was an opportunity for God to like redeem his story. Mm. So, um, with him, his, his father left him at a very young age. So there's a lot of hurt and brokenness there. And I felt like I knew our child was a son. Like I knew he was a boy from, from the beginning. And I just knew that this would be God's way of redeeming my husband's story. And giving him the opportunity to do things differently and to be a good father. So I feel Mm -hmm. like the enemy did not want that to happen. Like Mm -hmm. he did not want that freedom and that peace and that healing, especially for um, my husband. Yeah. And when you were uh, prophesying and you were saying God's word, did you feel God's presence right away? Or did you feel like you had to continue to bring God in day after day after day to kind of fight through this warfare? Yeah, no, it was, it was a day after day thing. I had to keep, you know, taking each thought captive and Mm -hmm. um, speaking his promise over myself, over uh, my son. And the time that I did hear him really clearly was I was sitting on the couch and I think I was, you know, thinking about this and feeling that worry that I had never felt before. And even, I think I was feeling it over like the delivery, which I have had, you know, three natural births. He was the third one. And I always enjoyed labor and delivery. I mean, just beautiful in my mind. And I know that sounds crazy to some people, but I was even scared about that. And I just knew like, this is not from God, this fear at all. And as I was sitting there, um, I heard God so clearly, I swear it was like so specific. I heard him say, pick up the book of Psalms, start reading it from beginning to end, circle the ones I tell you to circle, start praying them and don't stop until I tell you to. And I was like, my goodness, that is so random and so specific. (laughs) That is not for me. Like, where did that even come from? But I was like, yes, Lord. So, you know, picked up the book of Psalms and, and started reading through them. And the ones I really felt like, okay, this is one I need to pray over myself and my, and my son, I would circle it. Um, 
because I had read the book before The Circle Maker, which is by um, Mark Batterson, really, really powerful book. So I was like, all right, I'm going to circle this prayer right here in scripture. And then I wrote out prayers next to it too, and continued to pray that all the way until our son was born. So it was about a month of like praying nonstop. Mm -hmm. So that with speaking his promise over us was how I was able to, to get through that period of, you know, spiritual attack. And what promises did you find? Um, One in particular was like Psalm 91. I circled, I want to say it was like the end, you know, I have, I have it down here um, in my bookshelf, but the end of that one, gosh, it's so amazing how that actual prayer was what I ended up praying when I was in the NICU. Like that was Mm -hmm. the one I clung Mm -hmm. to so much. I pray that over and over again to the point where I had the ending of it memorized. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that was one that I really, really clung to was Psalm 91. And it's crazy because I didn't even at that point, I didn't know what was ahead of me, but I love how God goes before us and he prepared me. And we can talk about that too, but he, he totally prepared me with the words to pray when I was too paralyzed with fear to even pray. Yeah. And that was a really important part of preparing you for your Mm -hmm. journey. Right. So, um, I mean, let's go there where, how else did God prepare you? Well, those specific Psalms that I prayed, that was the preparation for sure. Like he totally equipped me with that because once our son was born, he was 42 weeks. So he was a little overdue, but he was only four pounds, 14 ounces So we knew right away, like he's sick, like something Mm. is wrong. Like this is not normal. And, um, it was like 36 hours later that he seized in my arms and we had to call, um, an ambulance and go 40 minutes to the hospital. And I remember in that really traumatic, extremely fearful time, um, I wanted to pray. I wanted to pray these big, bold, like healing, miraculous prayers. But in the middle of that trauma, all I could get out was like, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. Like that was it. I was Mm. just crying and I could only get out his name. Mm -hmm. I couldn't even string together thoughts, like nothing. And that feeling of your child being like in distress and like on the verge of life and death and not being able to do anything is heartbreaking. It is like, I can't even put it into words. Um, but that ended up being the start of our 37 day NICU stay in the hospital. And, um, there were times in, you know, the first few days and even the whole 37 where, I just felt like I was in such survival mode that I I didn't even know what to pray. I could I couldn't even I couldn't even pray. I couldn't string anything together. Like I could barely go to the bathroom and get something to eat. I was by his side the whole time, just mm-hmm. like in shock. So I turned to my Bible and the book of Psalms and everything was easy. It was already bookmarked for me because I bookmarked them. They were circled. So even when, yes, like it was such a relief because all I had to do was just read them, you know, silently and just read those words. And I was praying to God. I was praying the word back to him. And it was the exact ones that I needed for that peace and comfort and encouragement. And it just was such a treasure and so faith building that even though I had no idea this was coming, he goes before us. He already knew it was coming and he prepared me. He cared enough for me to prepare me and give me exactly what I needed. And I'm still in awe by that. That's amazing. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So before your son was born, Mm -hmm. when you were going through, you know, the Psalms and circling and going through this exercise, did you feel like you didn't understand why God was, yeah, (laughs) (laughs) 
So how did you keep continuing to do it? You know, I was like, is this because something bad's going to happen when I'm like giving birth? Like, is my son going to be huge? Because my husband's six, five. So I think I Mm -hmm. was like expecting this really big baby. And I was like, Oh Lord, like this is going (laughs) to hurt. You know, I'm going to do this naturally when we're doing so I was fearful in that way, but I was like, all right. I think from what I felt like that spiritual warfare, I think I knew that there was a battle ahead. I just, I Mm -hmm. thought in my own understanding, I thought it was going to be delivery. I had no idea it was going to be after. So as I was like laboring, I was like, oh, no, I'm fine. I was like, you don't need to read these over me. Cause originally I asked him like, will you read these verses over me and just help to give me peace? Um, but I felt really good during that process. So I was like, I don't even, I don't even need this. Like I'm good. I feel covered. And, um, yeah, it, it wasn't until, until after that, that's when I needed it. So I definitely had no idea why God was calling me to that, but I've found that obedience to him is so important. Even when we don't understand, like if God tells you to do something, I do it. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Right. I think that's the tough part, Mm -hmm. right? Because our mind starts bringing in logic. Yeah. Like, well, this doesn't make sense or no, I'm fine. Um, Mm -hmm. And speaking of, you know, you, you leaned into God during that time and you were obedient to his calling to read Psalms, but then there's also all the, the doctors and, you know, Mm -hmm. going to appointments and them checking to see if your baby's okay. So how did that play into this whole journey? Yeah, it, it was really hard because for one, um, being from Vermont, very earthy, crunchy, very hippie, so to speak, um, very natural, holistic, all of that. So having a home birth, I really wanted to avoid the hospital. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So it's very ironic that that's where I ended up. But um, yeah, as far as like the doctors and different diagnoses go and different tests, um, it was a huge surrender for me. Um, I feel like if I'm being honest, I probably, um, I probably had like holistic living on the throne. Like I idolized Mm -hmm. that. I really thought, that um, if I ate right, if I, you know, avoided toxic chemicals, all that, I would not die prematurely. Like I would be healthy. I would never get cancer. And I believe the same for my children too. So when we got to the NICU and then I had to make a decision like, all right, do you want to hold tightly to all those organic, earthy, crunchy ways, or would you rather have your son? I had to totally surrender, let go of everything that I believed in my understanding to be the way I had to surrender and trust God that he was going to move through these doctors. He was going to move through modern medicine and that, um, his plans for my son were going to prevail. And I didn't have to, you know, do X, Y, and Z. I just had to surrender and trust, which was a challenge. (laughs) Yeah. That's so hard. I mean, it's, Mm -hmm. it's tough for us to trust when it's our personal situation, but when it's our children, yeah, man, Mm -hmm. that that's a whole other level of trust Yeah, (laughs) and surrender too. And I, and I hadn't experienced that with my other two children. So this was Mm -hmm. very much (laughs) life-changing. So walk us through that 37 day NICU journey. What did that look like? Yeah. Um, it was long and I know other Mm -hmm. people, um, have even longer stays. I mean, I'm talking like hundreds of days, but for us, it was very long and very stressful. We were, um, in a hospital close to home for the first six days of our stay. And that included Christmas, which we were supposed to be discharged on Christmas day. And then, his lab results weren't where they wanted them to be. So that was very heartbreaking to not be able to be home on Christmas. I think all, you know, so many of us have that image in our mind of like Christmas at home with your family. And it was really hard to be separated from our girls and be in this tiny hospital room that didn't look anything like Christmas and then have our son fighting to survive. 
So that was really a tough moment. And then we went home, we were discharged for about a week and doing a different lab tests the whole time. And then his numbers spiked and we had to go back to the ER. And then we were um, transported to a higher level NICU, a more serious NICU, which ended up being an hour and a half from home. And we spent 31 days there living in the Ronald McDonald house attached to the hospital um, and literally by his side, like 12 hours a day. So it, it was definitely a lot of perseverance and really like taxing on your mental health in that every minute things can change in the NICU. Like it's very touch and go. There's lots of beeping alarms that are going off, which can be so triggering for anxiety. Um, really yeah, <laughs> the toughest yeah. thing I think I've ever endured for sure. And did you find that you were struggling with your faith at any point where you were asking God, come on, God, like heal us, help us here. Yeah. I feel like given my past and like my testimony and how God saved me from the pit that if he saved me from death, I was clinging to that. Like if he's, if he can save me, he can save my son too. He's been so Mm -hmm. faithful to me that why wouldn't he be faithful now in this, in this circumstance? So I feel like I was really strong in my faith and I felt like kind of had to be for my husband and for my son. Um, so yeah, I, I felt, I felt good. I was like, he's going to walk us through this. We're get, we're going to get through this, but there were those moments where, you know, we had like probably five different diagnoses like thrown at us because they really couldn't figure out what was wrong with our son until like three days before we discharged. So like on day, you know, 30, 35 or day 34 is when they finally figured it out. But I think for me, it came to this point when they were sharing the different diagnoses and, and the doctor had said something like, you know, you may just not be able to kind of like throw around the baseball with your son in in the front yard. If he has this genetic, you know, disorder, his bones could be very brittle and they could break and he may just not even be able to, to get around very well. And so my husband, I know was like crushed in that moment. And for me, I just remember again, kind of like surrendering to God. And at the same moment thinking that, um, if this is what it is for us, we're going to find gratitude and celebration in all the things he can do. We're not going to focus on the things he can't do, but we're going to like celebrate the blessing that he is. And there were also the moments where, you know, we weren't sure if we were going to lose him. And I just remember like seeing in my mind, like holding my son and then extending my arms out to God, kind of saying, you know what? he's yours to begin with. And if for whatever reason you need, you need to take him or this is how it is for him, God, I will be heartbroken, but I trust you. I love you. I will continue to praise you, even though I am broken and a mess. Like I, I trust you kind of like, you know, in the, in the story about Abraham and and Isaac, like that, like all right, Lord, like, I love this child so much. Thank you so much for giving him to me. But at the same time, like he's yours first, like he's on loan to me. So if it's time, even though his life has been short, like if it is time for me to give him to you, um, okay. And it was a really tough moment. Like it all kind of happened, you know, with my eyes open and in silence, but I will never forget the pivotal moment for me, even in that surrender I had this vision. That's the only only way I can describe it. Like my eyes were open, but I saw this young man, tall, strapping, healthy, light hair, blue eyes. And he just looked at me with like this knowing, like this familiarity. Like I knew him. He looked at me fondly. He, he smiled. And I knew in my heart, as crazy as it sounds, I was like, that's Ezra. Like that's, 
that's my boy. And I just, yeah, it was. My gosh. I just got chills, Jessica. Right. I mean, <laughs> and oh, see, I didn't know too. Um, it was just indescribable, but I felt like it was God saying to me, he's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. We're going to get through this. He's going to be okay. And that vision alone, not only carried me through the rest of our NICU stay, but then down the road, um, when he was 18 months old, he almost died in his sleep and we had to go to the pediatric ICU for three days. And that vision carried me through that experience because I was like, no, God showed me a vision of my child growing up and being healthy and strong. Like I don't have mm -hmm. to fear. Like he gave me that and it was so faith building. And it's still like it, even in the day to day when, you know, things arise and, and I get triggered and I feel that fear and anxiety, I can see in my mind still that beautiful image of my son. And it's just, it's amazing because when I originally saw it, Ezra had dark eyes and dark hair, and he was so bronzed with jaundice, but now he has light hair and beautiful blue eyes. And oh my we never, yeah, we never would have. <laughs> We never would have seen that or, you know, imagined it, but in that vision, that's what God showed me. So I feel like that was like proof mm -hmm. too, you know, it was just really, really beautiful. Like yeah. incredible. Yeah. Proof that God, God knows he, he yeah. goes before us. Goes before us. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I love that you stretched out your, your hand, so to speak in faith mm -hmm. to God. I mean, mm -hmm. that's the ultimate surrender, right? Like here's yeah. my child. He is yours. And so hard he met you there, mm -hmm. you know, you were, you were being obedient and he met you. I feel I like, love that. yeah, my vision was kind of like, you know, the, like in the story in the scripture where there's like a Ram right over a, mm -hmm. that just appears. That was kind of like my Ram. Like I saw this vision of my son and then I, I didn't have to fully surrender him. Like God didn't have to take him, mm -hmm. you know? So it was really, really powerful really like, I'll never yeah. forget that for as long as I live. It was a really beautiful, like intimate moment that God gave me in a time where I really needed it, obviously. Right. And it's, it carried you through another yeah. moment that happened Continues. more than mm -hmm. a year later. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And even in the day to day, cause we've still had moments that are, you know, really scary that remind us of this past experience with the pediatric ICU. And we kind of like instantly go back there. Like we have that panic rise up in us, but I can fall back on that vision that he gave me that my son is going to grow up to be big and strong and healthy and mm -hmm. totally fine. I want to rewind just a little bit more because mm -hmm. you had such a strong foundation of faith going mm -hmm. into this, this scary NICU journey. Yeah. And I want to dig a little bit more into how you built that faith. Um, mm -hmm. what exactly did you do? Because when you walk into something that's scary, mm -hmm. if you have that faith, you have something very solid to grasp onto yeah. you have to build it. Right. So what did you, yeah. I really think, um, my strong faith comes from my, my testimony. And I, I don't know if you want me to, to share, to share that, but, um, yeah, I feel let's like do it, it. Let's do it. Okay. So I feel like it comes from there, which was about five and a half years ago when I was previously married and I was married to a man of a radically different faith. So he was Muslim. I was not a follower of Jesus at all. I knew nothing about God and our marriage ended up falling apart. And I remember being pregnant with my second about like eight months pregnant and just really like collapsing on the bathroom floor and thinking, how did I get here? The one thing that I didn't want to do in life was get a divorce like my parents, because I knew how much it wrecked, you know, my life, my childhood, all of that. So that was the last thing that I wanted to do because I didn't want to do that to my, to my children. And, um, I found myself there. And so I felt like a complete and utter failure. And I remember, falling to the bathroom floor on my knees and just crying. And, um, you know how they say, like some people see your life 
flash before your eyes before mm-hmm. you die. Um, yeah. my experience was not like that. It was like this reel of all the horrible things I had ever done in my life and all, you know, the horrible things I had done to people, all the horrible things mm-hmm. that had happened to me. And I really felt like I was being pulled down into this pit. I mean, it was dark. It was hopeless. I really feel like, you know, I, I know at this point, and I think I kind of had an idea of it then that, that the devil didn't want me to live. Like he was like mm-hmm. luring me in to like, just end it. You know, Gosh. you're, you're a failure. Like, um, you've ruined your life. You had one life to live and look what you did with it. Like there's no recovering from this. How are you going to be a single mom of two kids? You don't have a job. Like, Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it was so heavy. So I really was like going deep down into this pit. And then I remember, um, crying out, God help, God help me please. And I, I didn't know God at all, but I was calling out to a God and saying like, God help me like save me, like help me. And I just Mm -hmm. fell asleep, you know, saying that over and over again, crying. And then I woke up the next day and I had this peace and I didn't have those feelings about, you know, wanting to, to end it all. And I really feel like in that moment, just like, you know, that Psalm, I think it's Psalm 40 or 41 about pulling you out of the mud and the mire. Mm -hmm. That is totally what happened. I know for, you know, without a doubt, that the Lord saved me in that moment. And I feel like because he carried me through that and then everything that followed with being able to leave that marriage safely, because it was not a safe um, relationship for me. And even I felt like at the time for my newborn baby, I feel like God really carried me through that. He provided for me when I didn't have a home or, you know, a car or anything, a job. So because of what he did for me, and then I started going to church and I was like in the Bible for hours. I mean, I couldn't Mm -hmm. get enough. I was just constantly reading the Bible, doing studies, like every, I did like all the things because he became my everything. It was no longer about me. Like I was head over heels, totally in love with Jesus because he saved me. Like, yeah, just like, you know, with Mary, he like totally saved her. And Mm -hmm. that's, that's how I felt for me. So from that, you know, moment on, I was a hundred percent all in on fire for Jesus. And, um, because of all of that, that, you know, set the stage for the rest of the the trials in my life. Like if Mm -hmm. he got me through that, he could get me through anything. Yeah. Oh, that is so good. Yeah. So it good. was, it was intense. And I just, yeah, I, I've, I've always come back to that. Like if he could do all those things that he did for me then and show up for me and provide and make a way. I mean, I feel like he parted the the sea in my life. So I knew going into the NICU that gosh, of course he can do it here too. Like he's going to carry me through this. He's good. He's faithful. I learned his character, who he was, and that's what I clung to. Yeah. And you're doing such amazing work through your story, right? And I can see why, you know, why the devil probably didn't want you to succeed in life (laughs) because I mean, you are blessing so many families who are going through the NICU, PICU child loss journey through your ministry praying through. And I want to talk a little bit more about that. Can you share the mission, the goals, and just tell us more? Yeah, absolutely. So once we were discharged from the NICU, it took a little bit until I felt like I was ready to be able to pour into other people. Like once I was healed, I, I guess you would say, because it was traumatic. But while I was in the NICU, I felt like God, um, called me to like pray for people and, what I mean by that is, you know, we were living in the Ronald McDonald house and we were around these different families all the time. And you see people hurting and worried and you see the ups and downs. Even when you're going to check into the NICU, you see them at the counter. And I just feel like God called me out of my comfort zone to make connections and relationships with these women to ask about their babies by name and to pray for them. So I started keeping a journal and um, writing down the names of the babies and the parents and um, praying specifically 
for their children. And then six months later is when he, again, spoke pretty clearly. It's like, create an online group <laughs> called Praying Through the NICU. <laughs> so I was like, okay, like, I don't know what I'm doing. But again, the obedience thing, I'll yeah. trust you. And it's just been amazing how it's grown. It started out as, again, you know, an online community for women and helping them to pray through the NICU. So very Christ centered, not a support group that like, you know, ask questions about medical things or anything like that, but a group to pray for one another when, you know, you're too paralyzed to pray yourself, you can Mm -hmm. read the prayers other people are writing for you. So it started out like that. And then as um, things began to grow, it was really hard that uh, a lot of the babies we were praying for so faithfully, like not all of them made it, you know, not all of them made it home. Like they mm-hmm. made it home to heaven, but um, it was really painful and really hard. And that is what kind of started our outreach, which our mission is to equip and embolden men, women, and children with biblical truth and encouragement as they journey through these difficult seasons of the NICU, the PICU, and child loss. And it was when families started experiencing child loss that I I was like, I have to do something. And the best thing I can do is like point them to Jesus. So I'm going to send them devotionals for grief um, that are rooted in, in scripture and I'm going to, you know, draw, draw them a a picture of like Jesus holding their baby so they can have that peace and that assurance that their child is safe and held and fully alive and fully healed in heaven. So that's how that started. Um, And then, yeah, the PICU group came once we were in the PICU. I felt like God was like, add this to the list. So, Mm -hmm. so we added, you know, the PICU to the list too. So our, yeah, our aim is just to um, to provide that biblical truth and support during the really difficult times. And we do that for families in the United States via outreach care packages. But we also serve a lot of families around the world and um, provide them support via virtual events that we hold and also electronic resources and things like that. But especially our Christ-centered communities have been really powerful for families. And mm-hmm. it's it's such a such a blessing for us to to pray and see to see God at work every single day. It's just it's beautiful. Yeah, it is a beautiful ministry. Oh, thank you thank so you. much, Jessica, for doing that. Thank you. Oh, he again he told me, he told me to do it. So I did it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I love that obedience is is just such a theme throughout your journey. And it's funny. I wasn't always obedient as a child. So, you know, (laughs) now I, now I finally am to my, my heavenly father. Yeah. But yeah, I think obedience leads to blessing, not just for blessing for me, but blessings for other people. When we're Mm -hmm. obedient, he just, it always leads to, to blessing. Yes, absolutely. So I, I love to get our listeners involved and be able to support your ministry. So where can they go? Sure. No, we would, we would love that as a nonprofit, we're fully funded by um, the generous donations of others. So that's appreciated any kind of support. Um, You can find us at www.prayingthroughministries.org. And we're also, of course, you know, on Instagram, praying through ministries, and then on Facebook, praying through ministries, like we've kept it simple. So we're the same (laughs) on all the platforms. You can find us there. Lovely, lovely. All right, Jessica. Well, before we end today, I'd love for you to just share some words of hope for moms who are struggling uh, through just some difficult stuff with their kids. You are able to surrender your, your son to God. I mean, how do moms do that? And how can they put their trust in God that he is in control? Yeah, it's, it's not, it's not easy. And it wasn't like a one and done for me. I I still feel like I have to surrender my children, not even just Ezra either, but I have to surrender them all into God's hands. And I think the encouragement would be to get in the Bible, 
find, you know, maybe like a mentor, someone who's like a few steps ahead of you, but really learn his character. Like last year, I read the Bible in a year and I read it through the lens of God's character. Like I had a specific Mm -hmm. highlighter for that. And just knowing who he is has been a total game changer because if we know that the the devil is the deceiver and he comes to steal, rob, and destroy, mm-hmm. then you know that he's going to try to look like God in some different ways. And especially I think when it comes to child loss, a lot of people will feel like, you know, God took their baby and because that's kind of, you know, what it might look like, but the enemy is the one who takes, he steals. God is a giver. He's the giver of good gifts. And He gives abundantly. If we can really hone in on God's character and know who he is, then that can get us through any season in our lives. Just knowing who he is, because he's the same, you know, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He's never changing. So if we know who he is, that's what we can cling to. Beautiful. And so much truth there. Mm, Thank you. Well, I really enjoyed our conversation, Jessica. Again, thank I you for too. making the thank time. You so much. No, yeah. I'm I'm so honored to to share, and I just pray that something you know speaks to those who are listening, and um, I just pray that it encourages their their faith. If he you know has done it for me, he can absolutely do it for you. This is such an amazing testimony of obedience leading to incredible blessing and purpose. God can turn things for good and use our experiences to bless people beyond what we could ever imagine. So, how do we stay obedient to God? Jessica had some really great advice. First, preach God's word over and over to yourself and for yourself. Now, in order to do that, we have to read the scripture and really dig into it. Circle and write prayers and promises down to remind yourself of who God is. And if you don't know where to start, Psalms is a great place to start. Jessica mentioned Psalms 91, and there's such hope-filled promises in that chapter alone. Things like, He is my refuge. He will shelter you. He will cover you. He will rescue you. Second, take each thought captive. Like Julie Plagans from episode 12 said about negative self-talk, put up a big red stop sign in your mind when a thought goes against what God says about who you are and whose you are. Our minds can wander into all sorts of things, am I right? Now, not all wanderings are bad. Some are wonderful. Dreams, aspirations, those are great and good things. But others aren't so great. So take those captive, take those prisoner and arrest them. Third, find a mentor. This word mentor often relates to professional careers, but it can be meaningful for our faith lives as well. A mentor can help you better understand God's word, keep you accountable, and remind yourself of his goodness. Small groups at church are a great place to start learning and connecting with those around you in order to help you find that mentor. And lastly, remember that God always goes before you and he's preparing you. So when you hear his calling, it may not be for a situation or circumstance you're in right now. It might be to prepare you for something that is going to happen. Jessica had no idea what God was preparing her for. She thought it was for the delivery of her baby, but that was not the case. But God knew. And when she was in the depths of anxiety and fear, she had already done the obedient work that became her source of strength and carried her through those dark moments. Now, I have no doubt that God would have still provided peace and reassurance if she didn't answer his calling prior to her NICU journey, but perhaps she wouldn't have been able to lean into God's firm assurance and hope as deeply or as quickly as she did. So look out for the ways God is calling you to obedience. Spend time with him in his word. Be still before him. Literally, be still and quiet your own voice. 
and firmly root yourself in who God is. For last week's Easter episode, I put together a compilation of all the ways my past guests have described God's character and goodness. So if you need a good reminder from another mom, check that out. I'll link to it in the show notes. All right, before I leave you today, I encourage you to check out Praying Through Ministries and support their mission and fundraising events that help fund the care packages and other faith-based resources sent to families going through NICU, PICU, and child loss. The next event is a virtual 5K called Through the Wilderness coming up on May 14th. And they've also done a lot of amazing outreaches to families living in hospitals over Christmas. They're doing a Mother's Day outreach and for Father's Day as well. So I'll have all of their social media links on momsgrabcoffee.com 15. So be sure to follow them for more events and ways to get involved. Okay, friend, thanks for hanging with me today. If you're enjoying Mom's Grab Coffee, please share it with your friends so we can continue to help bring hope to more people with these amazing testimonies. You can send them to momsgrabcoffee.com. That's where we have all the episodes. That's momsgrabcoffee.com. All right, that's a wrap for the month of April. Can you believe it? We're already four months into 2022. All right, next week, I'm grabbing coffee with the lovely and awesome Sandy Brannon, who's going to give us some wisdom on how to navigate the detours in motherhood well. It's going to be awesome. So I'll catch you next week for another cup of coffee with a side of faith, wisdom, and hope.